Okay, so this is September the 9th, 2023, and we're going to talk to you about the internal groan to be released. Uh, we find our scripture text this morning out of Revelation chapter 6 and verse 8. We will later on look at also a fundamental scripture out of 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Now, John on the Isle of Patmos, in this vision that he had, he says in verse 8 of chapter 6 of Revelation, I looked and there before me was a pale horse. Its rider was named Death, and Hades was following close behind him. Right there at that introduction, you can see that Death and Hades are two different things. Death and Hades, they were given power over one fourth of the earth to kill by sword, famine, and plague, and by the wild beasts of the earth. So two persons or personages are mentioned, death and Hades. And we will talk about death and we will talk about Hades in other sessions of this new series. I want you to see that death and Hades they are personalities. Death is a personality, a person. Death is given power to kill with dying. So when death touch you, you die. What we are fighting is not dying, but death. We will say, yeah, but Jesus overcame death. Yes, he did 2000 years ago. And he's the first fruits that overcame death. We are the fruit following. If the head did it, then the body must also do it. The head did it legally, objectively, 2000 years ago, and the body must still subjectively, experientially step into that place where we can bring all things under his feet. So I want you to see the grave consequences of a church that misinterpret and misunderstand what church is all about. Church is more than just us having the songs that we sing and the stuff that we do, but it's to understand that there is a battle. It's the ultimate battle. There's a war to bring the final enemy under the feet of Jesus, which is the church. So death is a personality. He kills with dying. So what we're fighting, as I said, is not dying, but death. Death has power to kill you with death or dying. One of death's weapons is dying. The last, the last principality that sits at the right hand of Satan, that is always his major draw card, is death. He is a spirit, a power, a prince, and he has been given power to kill everybody with death. He is the last enemy and the apostolic has been commissioned to make death Christ's footstool. So I want you to see when you say you are apostolic, what more is at stake? It is more than a song we sing. It is a mentality that we must operate by. It is a stance, a posture in the earth. Come hell or high water, I'm standing. Irrespective of what life throws at me, there is a pathway that we need to follow. And we are a first fruit company in the earth, an apostolic company. And we need to showcase by popular design and behavior that we are a different species that lives on the planet. We've got a different mentality. We exist differently. We love differently. We give differently. We obey differently. We are a different type of person. So the strategy of Satan is to keep us blinded to the reality of the real and last battle. There is the last battle that must be fought. This enemy, death, has never been challenged. But way back in the Old Testament, one singular saint, Enoch, broke free 
from this principality because he touched a certain frequency in God. In the coming weeks, we will talk about Enoch's technology. Our generation <clears throat> has to engage this prince, fight him, find word in the scripture to approach him and to come to a place where we begin to unshackle ourselves from him. Yes, we are all subjected to death while being caught in the temple of this fleshly body. But we will see later that Paul cries and he groans and he says, I want to be released from the temple of this body, that I may be clothed over with my heavenly abode. There is another abode. There is another body. But there needs to be a people. Otherwise, we will be here in the earth for the next 50,000 years and Jesus doesn't come back. There must be a church that now come to this realization that we're not just here to play games, but we are here to operate by a certain stature in the earth. I was very afraid to talk about this this morning uh, because the Lord gave me these messages many years ago and, and, and I sort of put them away and I was afraid to start talking about them. Because I know that way back, nearly 15 years ago, when Pastor Thamu began to talk about issues like this, people began to die in his church. Because that prince is not going to be left unchallenged. But I said to the Lord, we are in this, in this fray, in this battle. What more, can I, what more can my life touch? What more can the enemy throw at us? He has thrown over the years so many things at us, but we overcame by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimony. And the Bible says we must not love our lives unto the death. It's a different species. And so our generation has to engage this prince. This then dictates a certain requirement from us. What's the requirement? There must be a, more, a much more deeper level of maturity developing a groan on the inside that overwhelms us. There must be a generation of people that are led toward the ultimate battle. We must begin to exist like that in the now. It's not for tomorrow. It's not there in the distant future or another generation. There must be a sector of the church that would capture the ultimate understanding that caused God to say, I will take you like he did Enoch. We want new thoughts, new mindsets, and new methods of church as we come to the close of this epoch of time. There must be a whole new complexity of the cry of our hearts. We must evolve, as it were, in the spirit to a different level because our objective is not just another meeting. Our objective is not just having an apostolic network. Our objective is not just to have a platform from which we speak. Our objective is God himself, the creator. We want all that he is to come into this realm. We do not want to have the realms disconnected. We want it to become one thing where God relocate out from the heavenlies and he comes into this realm for eternity. That's what we are after. That's what we are contending for. We want all that God is, the everlasting one, the ruler of the realm, the creator of the universe. God himself is our stopping place. We are not satisfied by gifts anymore, raising the dead or some spiritual ministry. We must be satisfied only by God, making his eternal dwelling among men. That's what Revelation says. Now the dwelling of God is among men. Not we in this realm and he in another realm, but the two realms connected. Apostolic people are not satisfied by a manifestation. Even if a million people get healed of terminal diseases, we are not satisfied. We are not satisfied in advance, but we want God to show up. We want him to indwell in reality all that we are. We are not satisfied even if a million people give their hearts tomorrow to Jesus. I, I will only be satisfied when God comes in reality. 
death overcame, Satan bound, and the ages are fulfilled. That's where the apostolic church should post, uh, push the advance of the kingdom toward. But how many of us have got this mentality as we not even have deep inside of us this longing and this desire for him to appear a second time? For our citizenship is not on the earth, it's in the heavens, from where we are awaiting a savior that these vile bodies must take on his glorious body. We want an exchange of bodies. We want out of this body of flesh and we want this body in a twinkling of an eye to put on his glorious body. There is not many in the church that I believe is talking or even thinking on this frequency because we are happy with the status quo. We are happy just to go on a Sunday, come back, feel nice, and okay, I've paid my tithe, I've gone to the service, I, I mean I'm a good Christian, and that's it. The enemy is not feeling the pinch of a church that is prodding him. But I believe that I'm awakening a people in the earth, and this is tough for me to do because the lashbacks that I get is very tough. Because the enemy hates what I do, the enemy hates what I say. And I don't care who says what, this is what I will stand for. I don't care if you're the greatest apostle in the earth, I will declare what God has told me. And I will die believing it, put my head on a block if I need to. But what I believe is what I believe. And I want to take as many people as possible with me in this realm. Of understanding amen so if we have to come into greater moments we have seen exploits but we are not content with our current position we will never be happy with our current level of life the only thing that will satisfy us is when he personally turns up I'm not talking about him coming in his body I'm talking about Jesus in his return a second time back in this earth that's the stopping place that's the finish that's when death is swallowed up forever in life and that last enemy is put under his feet i want you to begin to think with me on this level and i know it's difficult because we're changing a mindset here of people in the way that we need to exist from day to day so we redefine our corporate existence, our stance, our posture in the spirit, the way we believe, the way we cut covenant and speak. We are not satisfied. We refuse to be satisfied by anything God does for us and through us. The only thing that will satisfy us from this point on is God himself, all of who God is. That's what we are after. That's what Sean is after. We want the end of all things. Second Peter 3, 1, Second Peter 3 from 11 to 3 says the following. Second Peter 3 verses 11 to 13. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought we to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth, the home of righteousness. Are we looking forward? Standing on tiptoe waiting for him to come? Or are we happy with the status quo? There's a certain way of life which expedites the coming of the Lord. Only when we exist like this can we begin to design authoritative activity in the earth. Only then can we pray prayers out of the right level of hunger. Only then are we immune against the major princes. Only then can we truly go into battle and take nations. In Psalm 102, and that Psalm I 
unfolded to you at the beginning of this year as my first message for 2023. Verse 19 and 20 says, The Lord looked down from his sanctuary on high. From heaven he viewed the earth. To hear the groans, I want you to listen to this. To hear the groans of the prisoners and release those condemned or appointed to death. <clears throat> listen to this. The Lord looked down from his sanctuary on high. From heaven he viewed the earth to hear the groans of the prisoners and release those condemned or appointed to death. There's a people appointed to death. It's appointed unto a man once to die and thereafter the judgment. We must look at the context in which that groaning functions. There is a people in groaning. God is looking down from heaven to view the earth, to hear the groans of the prisoners. They are imprisoned in death. They are, they are groaning to be released from their appointment with death. What must we look at contextually in which groaning is supposed to function? If they groaned when look, God looked down, and we are going to unfold these messages to you in other se sessions of, of this particular section of the work that we are doing. And I'm not just preaching messages to you to keep you happy. I'm past preaching messages to keep you happy. This is reality, brethren. This is where the church is going to go to. The ultimate battle is still ahead of us. But the church seems to be, a, be, be weak <clears throat> because we are not willing to come into this battle formation. What is the context of groaning out of Psalm 102? Groaning comes forth in a global season when the church rid itself of its locality and its geographical concerns within their own nation and they break into the global intent of God. That's when this groan becomes more profound in the earth. In that time when nations are coming to the Lord, it's got to do with the nations being coming back to God. It's the time when kings, the kings there, has got to do with political and governmental leadership in the earth are submitting to God. It's a time when Zion, the true church, is being built. It's a time when powerful governmental prayer from destitute hearts are not despised from the Lord. In all of this, God is looking down and he's hearing the groaning of the people. People are in prison, locked up, and they are groaning to be released. Who will release them? These that are appointed unto death, those who are groaning are those who are set under the death principle. This word appointed in Hebrew indicates is the word son of. It comes from the word ben, to be appointed, son of according to the class of, or those established according to the order of something. So you have in the earth sons of the order of death, a class appointed to death, groaning and saying, unshackle us, unburden us from our groan and from this prison of our flesh and the reality of the, the, the cultural existence and environment and context in which we find ourselves unshackle us, unburden us from the prison that we find ourselves in. How long do we want to live in our mortal state? How long do we want to pay mortgages and work and, and have all this stuff come against us? We want this realm to be changed radically. Now, I know that I might be talking over the heads of many of you this morning, but I just want to build faith this morning. This is a tough message because the enemy wanted to stop me because he put upon me yesterday some stuff and I had to fight through the night. But I know that this is the in message for now that many in the church is not ready to hear. Now I want to come to our text. The real text I want to I want to read that you find in your chat. 2 Corinthians 5 verses 1 to 5. Listen to this. 
Paul says, he writes to the church at Corinth and he says the following. Now we know that if the earthly tent we live in, referring to this body, is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven. So in other words, when you lay down the one, you pick up another. When you lay the tent of this body down, Paul calls also this tent of this body, the body of flesh, the body of carnality, the body in which Christ dwells, yes, but it's a body appointed unto death. But this body needs to be transformed, needs to be changed in the twinkling of an eye, to put, put on the glorious estate of Christ, to never die again. But there needs to be a church in the earth that pushed the parameters to that place where we want to see him come back. And in that sense, we're not happy with the status quo. I'm not happy by seeing the church doing mighty exploits only, gaining more nations, doing more ministry. The ultimate end is that we want that prince called death, that final draw card of Satan to be brought to a place of bended knee. That, the, that these bodies will, will put on incorruption. That will not just happen automatically. One day God decides today I am going to let my people put on immortality. No, there must be a church in the earth that works with God to bring the body to that state. It's not going to come just willy-nilly. There will be people dying in this battle. It's the ultimate battle. Jesus fought his battle 2,000 years ago legally to procure it. But we need to walk in it physically, exemplary. There must be a people before he comes that puts on this estate. Not all of us shall die, says Paul. But there will be a generation at his coming that will be alive. Not all of us will die. And that generation is what I want to be part of. But if there's not a people that yearn for it, and we're going on with the status quo, we're never going to get to that place. And I want you to begin to understand me. Many people misunderstand me. Because this is what I contend for. I'm not contending for church as usual. In fact, I'm tired of church as usual. I hate church as usual. This is church. This is the contention. This is where the minds must be reorganized toward. Oh, no, we're just building our building. We, 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 we want to have nice services. To hell with nice services. This is the contention of the apostolic brethren. This is where the rubber meets the road. A people that has got, that is so formed in their brains that they live in the earth as ordinary citizens, but they have a different mentality living in the earth. They are, they are, they are like salt in the earth, like light shining in a dark place. We go on a Monday to work, but we live and exist totally different in our minds. The posture of our lives are different, irrespective of what the circumstances says, irrespective of what the environment dictates to us. We know that we know that we know he is coming back. And we are living in such a way that we expedite that day of his coming. This is how the early apostles lived. This is what they contended for. That's why Jude says we must contend for the faith that was handed down by the forefathers to our generation. Contention means to fight a good fight, a good warfare. And if it means I perish like Esther says, I will perish. It's easy to quote the verse, but it's not easy when our flesh touches this dimension. When the devil sets his things against you. It's tough, but this is where the apostolic meets the rubber of the road. That's what I mean, embracing suffering. Having a breakthrough mentality, being intolerant with tradition. This is the apostolic stance in the earth. It's a different mindset. 
It's not a religious, institutionalized mindset. It's a breaking free of the bondages of the earth. It's a breaking free of what mankind says church ought to be, to bring it back to originality, to bring it back to credibility in the mind of God. It was God that looked down from heaven upon the earth to hear the groans of a people imprisoned by and appointed to the principle of death. That's what we're contending for. So Paul says, if this earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. Meanwhile, while we are alive in the tent of this body, what is the position? What's the posture? What's the disposition? Meanwhile, we groan. And it's not an external groan through your mouth. It's an internal posture of spirit. We groan, longing to be clothed over with our heavenly dwelling. Because when we are clothed, we will not be found naked. For while we are in this tent of this body, we groaned and we are burdened, Paul says. Because this body is being attacked with, with disease and sickness and we feel the environmental influence against it. And we feel all the pressure in this flesh. But there must be a people that says, I'm tired, I'm groaning, I want to be further clothed over with my heavenly abode. And that's where the apostolic saints are supposed to press the battle toward. And if it never happens in my generation, then at least I have seen it prophetically. And I've made a declaration in this generation that the next generation can pick it up and actualize it. That's why Sean Bluffnote lives. I'm not living for church. As usual. I'm past that. I'm existing different in my brain, in my mind, in my thoughts. That's why I'm breaking the order of church for you, for you that are here. People still long to go to a building on a Sunday. God says, Sean, break that. I know it's tough for me to do so, but I will do what he says to me I must do. Because I know when I hear resounding around the earth, other prophets that I know is genuine, they begin to speak the same thing. How God's going to change the order of church in the coming years. Five years from now, brethren, it's going to be a total different ball game in the earth. As persecution will heat up against us like never before. And we can't be weak, flaky, often minded saints. You got to know how to contend at the gates because the battle has been pushed to the gates of the enemy. And if you are a son of Abraham, that inheritance has been given you. I taught you on Hades. Hades is not death. Hades is a principality. And so we need to understand what is going on. So I'm giving you perspective this morning. It's tough. I see things and sometimes I don't know how to put it in words. I don't have the vocabulary to help us. So these people are appointed to death. So Paul says, while we are in this body, we groan. To be further clothed over. When last did you groan? When last did you have this disposition? I want out of this dimension. I'm tired of this dimension of life. But you see, this dimension of life is not going to end until he returns. Only when he returns, you change. Only when he press into this realm, will your body transform. But as long as he's not here, you will be in this old tent. And while he's not here, you will groan. I sense him here. For while we are in this tent of this body, we groan and are burdened. Because we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling so that what is mortal, this is what Paul is saying, may be swallowed up by life. This is mortal. This is subjected to the pressure of life. 
But when this is changed, transformed, to take on the form of his glorious body, the elements of the earth has got no longer hold over it. Now mortality is swallowed up in immortality. Corruption has put on incorruption. Perishable, the unperishable. And this mortality is swallowed up in life, his life, to be the same as he is. Now it is God who has made us for this very purpose, Paul says, and has given us the spirit as a deposit. So in other words, you already have a deposit of what's going to happen. The spirit is the first fruits deposited in your spirit to make sure that you are not going to miss this day. Guaranteeing what is to come. There's a guarantee because the Holy Spirit is the first fruit. He has been given as a deposit. It's not just, I want to speak in tongues. No, the Spirit has been given for more than speaking in tongues. This is the ultimate purpose why the Spirit was given. As a first fruit, Jesus is the first fruit sitting in heaven that overcame death. What is the first fruit teaching all about? It's not so much about money. Yes, the money teaches us from an, from an external dimension to a spiritual dimension. If he's the first fruit, it means there is a whole, a whole orchard of plants ripening in the earth to become like he is. Immortality is what calls us to be immortal is my longing. To be immortal is my desire. Have you got that desire? Or do you not want him to come back? That's why we need to contend for, for him to return, to come back. We want him back in the earth. I am not happy if a billion people get born again. What will make us happy is that when he's back, then all things transform. But there needs to be a certain posture by which we live to make that reality in the earth. It is not going to come just because we wish it. Brethren, <laughs> I don't know if you understand what I'm trying to get at this morning. And I don't think I'm going to get through my notes here. Because the notes is not the important issue. It's not about the notes. It's about this thing that has gripped my heart. So he says in Psalm 102, 19 to 20 again, The Lord looked down from his sanctuary on high. From heaven he viewed the earth to hear the groans of the prisoners and release those condemned or appointed unto death. The word release in the Hebrew is patak. It means to unshackle, to unhandcuff as it were, or to untie you. In other words, there are people in the earth handcuffed to the principle of death, shackled, imprisoned. They are sons of death, bend death, sons of death, appointed unto death. They are bound in chains. They are sons of death. And God begins to relocate. And when God begins to relocate from heaven, this is what John prophetically saw in Revelation 21, verses 1 to 3. Look at what John saw. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth has passed away and there was no longer any sea. Sea is not the sea that you see on the coast. It's got to do with unregenerate humanity. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out from heaven, out from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them, and be their God. For the old order of things have passed away. As the house is being built, who we are, as we are being built with the heavenly design, with heavenly material, God begins to indwell more and more of it. And so he unshackle us. As more of his life enters it, 
we get more unburdened, more unshackled, and looses them from the handcuffs of death. This is how it's going to happen. There needs to be a building in the earth. Something must be built. The more it's built, the more it's appearing out of heaven. Because, because Paul says, while we are in the tent of this body, we groan because we want to be clothed over with our real dwelling. And our real dwelling is in heavenly places. It's an invisibility. But the more we build our spirit man on the earth as the real house, it comes and descends out of heaven. And we are clothed over with this dimension. And the more we are being built up, the more the life of God fills this house. And the more this house is being filled with the life of God, the more the death strangle is being released from us. And we are now being liberated from that principle called death. That's what Jesus meant when he said, I saw Satan falling from, light, from, from heaven like lightning and he had no hold on me. Because there was no principle of Satan anymore in him that could give the devil a latch onto his life. So all satanic principles, all worldly principles, all Babylonian principles that are still caught in your brain and in your mind and in your body and in your thought life needs to be exterminated so that he can have no hold on you. Building the house and unshackling us from the death principle are connected and inseparable. So the most appropriate position for the church now, we groan. It's an internal groan. It's a silent groan. It's a way of life. It's a disposition. It's how we live. It gives us the conditions. So we groan in response to it. What does this word groan literally means? It is a deep inward situation of sorrow, a pain existing within the heart. I want out of this fleshly orientation. I'm sorrowful to the point of death. I'm no longer desirous. I can build it up in the gym. I can play sport to, to, to entertain it. But it will go six foot under. The abode of it in the current state is the graveyard. Doesn't matter how you pamper it, how you make it up, how you train it, how you bulk it up with muscles. It's appointed unto the grave unless it's transformed. Unless the mortal puts on immortality and that event is when he returns. So what should our posture be? It's not church as usual. It is groaning on the inside for him to return. That's the posture. It's an inward sorrow. A pain existing in the heart for him to come back. It's a cry of release. From the burdens of the Adamic elements till resident within me, which empowers the death principle within our lives. It is experiencing a loss along the way. It's an inward tumult, inward loss and in being inwardly destitute. It is a cry to deny that which shackles you, to operate as a son of death. It is stepping into carrying the rigors of God's task, but being harassed by your flesh to do it in perfection because of moral deficiencies, which imprisons an execution of the task. It is living in that juxtaposition of engaging the nations, seeking kings to bow to God, experiencing answers to prayers and experiencing the tender love of God. But we are not content. We want God himself. So we groan. I want you to see the balance. We'll do everything God has asked us to do. We will win the nations. We will preach the gospel. We will see the sick healed. We will pray to God for better life circumstances. But that's not where it ends. That's not the ultimate of church. The ultimate of church is the other side. We are in groaning for him to return. That mortality can put on immortality. 
That's the finish of all things. Do you understand what true church is all about? It's living in this position consistently. Where, where Paul says, I'm between two opinions. I would like to die to be with God, but I rather want to be in the flesh to be with you, that I can enlighten you of the place where I'm about to go. The apostle could have laid down his life long ago. At the end of his life, he said, I've poured out, I've poured out my life like a drink offering, and I'm ready to be offered up. Years before, years before his assignment, I mean, uh, was done. Paul had this longing. That's what he, he writes in Philippians. That I may know Christ. I've counted all things but done for that position. That I may live and not die. That I might enlighten the next generation. That's my prayer daily. Lord, keep me. Not because I want to live, but because I want to enlighten a next generation. With this dynam dynamic understanding of where God is taking his church to. It is a day in which we take the initiative. Where, sorry, where God takes the initiative. And he begins to confirm. He, he becomes valid and becomes strong in the church again. God wants to release a whole class of humans. That are bound by the principle of death. Why is God beginning to release those that groan? Again, Psalm 102. Very important Psalm. Verse 21 and 22. So the name of the Lord will be declared in Zion and his praise in Jerusalem. When the peoples and the kingdoms assemble to worship the Lord. God wants his name to be declared in Zion. That's the true church. Declared means to write to enumerate, to recount, to tell, to name, to utter, to praise, to boast about, to keep a book of remembrance of his great name. Not just sing a song, I love you, Jesus. But in reality, there's a deep sense of awe when that name is, is mentioned from your mouth. Not chewing bubblegum while you do it, but being in awe of him. Malachi 3.16 says, Then those who feared the Lord talk with each other. And the Lord listened and heard. A book of remembrance was written in His presence concerning those who feared the Lord and honored His name. The name. You need to come back to that name. Lord Jesus Christ. It was invoked upon you in water baptism. That name is in you and you in that name. So the new prayer for this season is, unshackle me. I'm handcuffed to the principle that my soul hates. I groan before you, God. Unshackle me. Lord, I declare to you to be that generation. Declared in Psalm 102. Lord, I bring the nations to you. Kings are bowing. But Lord, unshackle me from the death principle. You must begin to pray 21st century prayers. That line up to the present position of the spirit. We are changing our identity. We are changing the world structure of life. We exist with urgency and passion for him. No longer just, I'm a child of God. But living with passion, with reality. And whether God heals me or not, I will not deny him. Some people, when God never heals them, they want to give up. And they want to deny the faith. I've seen a pastor recently that has a mega church in America. Simply because things didn't go his way, he denied the faith, left the church and went into Islam. How can you do that? Because you don't have your way with God. God is sovereign. He can decide whether he will heal you or not. But I know that God is a healer. But leave that choice with him he is god he knows what he's doing you just live in the earth for him and worship him irrespective of what happens to your flesh 
Whether he blesses you or not bless you, you will not deny him like Job. Even though you slay me, yet shall I serve you. I don't care whether my whole body is full of bumps and full of bruises. Every part of me will still cry out unto the Lord. I love you, Lord, in spite of what I go through. That's the Christianity I'm talking about. Not this flaky thing that when things don't go my way, that's the way of the orphan. I want to deny God the right to be my God because I don't have it with God. No, we live in the earth for him, brethren, and he can do with us what he wants to because he's God. You must begin to live by what principles? And I want to end with this. I've got a few moments and I'm going to stop. Because I'm laying a foundation here for the next couple of weeks. For what we need to, you know, every message I'm giving you is, is taking you a little bit nearer and closer to where God wants us to become and to be. First, we spoke about the faith of Abraham. And you must go and look at those messages again. And now we're taking you further in this journey. We are maneuvering toward the ultimate place now. But you can't go to the ultimate place until you have first denied that which you love the most. Like Abraham. You can't come to the land of promise until you are willing to let go what you consider to be the best of your life and say, God, you take it, I'll offer it. I can't bring this message if we have not settled that first step with God. And now God says, journey further, son. I was wrestling yesterday in my spirit. I said, God, do you really want me to do this? He says, yes. Lay it as a foundation. Let's see where it will end up. Because we can no longer wait for others to get onto the wagon of where we're going. Time is of, 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 of necessity, brethren. We've got to make our minds up. Go join another church if you need to, where they play games. I'm not interested. I know a people must get to the ultimate finish. I'm not interested with church services and all the stuff that they say is church today. I'm interested in this position here. This is where the true church is maneuvering toward, the true apostolic church, not the flaky apostolic church. There is an apostolic church that is flaky in the earth today. I'm talking about the real apostolic church that lives and emulate what the early church apostles brought us into. This is their writings that we are now unfolding here this morning. Not even Sean's writings. I've got nothing. I just interpreted to you this morning. So, <clears throat> we must begin to live by what principles? And I'm going to end with this. Now listen to this. The quality and the power of any process is shaped by the perception of your destination. If you can't see where you're going, you are in a wilderness. If you don't know where you're going, you are in a wilderness. So the power of your process is shaped by your perception of your destination or your finish. What's the finish? What does the word process mean? The way by which you go is shaped by the perception of your destination or the finish. And this is how the finish beckons us, that we live in the power of the finish. Power or potency is the strength by which you accomplish that which you are doing, and it is shaped by your perception of your destination. What, what makes your process powerful is that you are hurled in by what you see in the future. But you see that destination and you want to live by it powerfully now. Destination shapes your process. Destination determines your way. We are talking about destination. The final destination that the Apostle Paul is talking about is immortality. It's our final destination. Yes, we humans, we're just talking about these things. 
But these are the frequencies that the enemy doesn't want the church to vibrate upon. The devil hates it when the church begins to talk the final destination. The devil wants to keep the church from talking the finish. Keep them busy with endless church activities and church services. But don't let them come onto this frequency. So I will bar this frequency from them. That generations will be tied to the death principle. I don't care. They can have nice services, but they must not resonate with this end time frequency. They mustn't come into this reality. Otherwise, I'm in trouble. If we understand our destination, we begin to understand how to live a qualitative lifestyle to not miss our destiny. It makes our process more qualitative to make the things that we do more enhanced, to make our declarations more powerful. This is the pathway to be overlaid with desire for him. As when your process, you understand the destiny and now your process become qualitative. There's no dull moment, even though you are in the valley Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil. For thou art with me. Thou art my rock, my rod, and my staff. He prepares before me a table in the presence of my enemies. He anoints my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Huh? Even if I'm caught in the valley of my life, because I've seen the finish, I'm lifted from the valley experience in my sight because my mind is attached to what is eternal. Oh, I sense him here in such great power. Thank you, Jesus. I just want to show you as I end the process. I want to talk about the process of Jesus, the process of Moses, and the process of the forefathers. But I want to talk and end today with the process of Moses. Let's look at Moses' process as I end. Hebrews 11, 24 to 27. Remember now we're talking process that is shaped by destination. If you see the destination, your process becomes qualitative. If you have a process without a destiny, you are in a wilderness. You're going round and round and round the mountain, round the mountain of life, and you never come to the destination. That's what happened to the children of Israel. They got caught in the wilderness for 40 years because they took their eyes off the destination and so they murmured against God to go back to the flesh pots of Egypt murmuring arrest your pro your forward progress murmuring is not always something that is done externally it's an internal disposition where a man reason with himself in his soul as to why he doesn't want to serve God anymore. Because God hasn't come through for me. I've prayed, but the Lord never answered me. So I don't think that God is real. You fool! To be a fool is to be mindless. We don't live in the earth so that God can bless us primarily. We live in the earth as objects of worship unto him, irrespective of the circumstances. That's why we live. I can tell you here today how I've lived my life right through up until today. With difficulty in my body, every day of my life. There's my wife, she can testify to it. But it has not stopped me from worshipping him, from praising him. And I 
constantly tell the Lord, even if you never heal me. So I've stopped praying for my healing. But Paul says, he prayed over and over to God, just remove this, this thorn in my flesh. And God says, no, my son, my grace is sufficient for you. And then Paul begins to pen these words. He says, I, if, if I am weak, then he is strong. And in my weakness, his strength is made perfect. So therefore, I will be weak that he can be strong. And many times God keeps us in that place. Because sometimes our flesh wants to protrude what God wants to do in our lives. And it, and it stops us from coming into the purposes of God. And God says, I'm putting a thorn in your flesh. And the only way for you to live is by my grace. And daily you come to God and say, thank you, Father. I will be weak that you might be strong. And out of that place, God begins to minister in you and through you. And that's how life flows unto others. A man totally crucified unto Christ, died to a reasoning mind and fully persuaded that God is real, irrespective of what my life is going through. Come, let me end this. Look at this. I want to just read this, make a few statements that I stop. Hebrews 11, 24 to 27, by faith Moses, look at Moses, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, for he looked to the reward. By faith he left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He persevered. Why? Because he saw him who was invisible. Why will a man choose affliction and suffering rather than the passing pleasures? And he esteemed the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt. And he looked to the reward. By faith he left Egypt, not fearing Pharaoh's anger. And he persevered. Why did he persevere? What kept him going? He saw him who is invisible. You can't see him in your circumstances. You give up. You get demoralized and cave in. So your focus must be on the invisible. You've got to have... You've got to have a state of being that you can see what is the eternal. Because the things temporal are the things natural and, and, and they can be overcome. But the things unseen, invisible, are the eternal things. So Moses is choosing to suffer affliction. For a man to choose willingly to suffer affliction, he is not operating by earthly frequency and standards. As Paul's conception of the eternal, immutable Christ increased, the more he got delivered and emancipated from his narrow earthly conception of Jesus being a Jewish Messiah, the more Paul began to realize that this Jesus is not just a fleshly, earthly man, but the more he saw him in his heavenly estate, as the eternal Christ, the transcendental Christ, the immutable Christ, the more he gets set free and liberated and emancipated from his narrow Jewish conception of Jesus just being a Jewish Messiah. He begins to lose sight of his culture, of his nationality and his identity, which was connected to the earth. And he began to say things like this, for to me to love is Christ, to die is gain. I counted all things but done for the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. There is no more male, nor female, nor Jew, nor bond, nor Greek, or free in Christ. We are all one in Christ. His confession began to change because he began to see the reality of the eternal state of the heavenly Christ. Our genealogy is lifted up into the eternity of that of Melchizedek. 
We no longer operate by the natural, fleshly, earthly, biological lineage of our lives. We are not cultural people. We've been lifted up out from our culture and the identification with our, our race and our nation. We are a holy nation. We're no longer Germans. We're no longer South Africans. We're no longer Swiss people. We're no longer Namibians. We are what? Sons of God. We are from another country. From the heavenly. Yes, after our earthly orientation, we are Germans and we are Swiss and we are South African. But in our eternal state, we are the sons of God. From another dimension, the timeless zone, we have come. That's what Jesus said to Pilate. My kingdom is not of this world. I'm coming from a different realm that is not bowing to time and space. That's the realm you are from because you are spirit, not first flesh. Moses is living in the earth, but he's operating by an entirely different system of life. The things that are seen are temporal, but the things unseen are eternal. He esteemed that the reproach of Christ was greater riches than the treasures of Egypt because he looked to the reward. It is important that if we want to powerfully activate ourselves in the things of God, that we have to be attached to a perception of an ultimate destination. We have to see clearly what we are moving towards. I want to stop with that this morning, brethren. There's much more in this message. And over the next few weeks, we will talk about this reality. We are of such a people, no longer bound by culture, no longer bound by nationality, no longer bound by our flesh. And while we are in the flesh of this body, while we are in the tent of this body, the posture of heart is we are groaning. And, the, and you remember Romans 8 says the whole earth is groaning for the sons of God to be made manifest. It's time for our manifestation. We can't groan with the earth. But there needs to be a people in the earth that has got this posture, this inward disposition, this longing, this desire, this inward tumult of heart that we want him to come back. We want the Lord Jesus to come back. We want the Lord Jesus to come back. We are not happy with the status quo. We want the Lord Jesus to return. We want the Lord Jesus to return. We want the Lord Jesus to return. That mortality can put on immortality. And that this visible puts on the invisible. And that the reality of our lives are now foundationally shifted. That that which is perishable become imperishable. That which is mortal becomes immortal. That's what we are striving for. That's what we are believing for. That's what we are hoping for. That's what we are existing for in the earth. So come on, brethren. Let's get the issues of the earth right. Love your wife. Let the small things of the earth no longer drive you. These are, these are fruitless little things that we worry about. Is the car washed? Why didn't you wash the car? Why didn't you sweep the house? These are non-entities in the big scheme of things. Yes, we will wash the car. It's not that important right now. But come, let's pray. Let's break bread. Let's get the problems out of the way, man. Let's get the niggling little things out of the way because we are the princes of the heavens. And we want to live a kingly life, a life of regality, a life that says we are different. That's my encouragement to you today. Now, Father, may the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the fellowship of the Spirit abide with us. In Jesus' name, amen.
God bless you. Thank you for listening to me again this morning.